Chat GPT roared into our consciousness at the very end of last year. And I had the opportunity to ask several admissions directors what they thought about applicants using it. That's what we're going to discuss today. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Accepted's founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Welcome to the 538th episode of Admission Straight Talk. Thanks for tuning in. Before I turn to the subject of today's show, I have a question for you. Are you ready to apply to your dream MBA programs? Are you competitive at your target schools? Acceptance the MBA admissions quiz can give you a quick reality check. Just go to accept.com slash MBA quiz, complete the quiz, and not only get an assessment, but tips on how to improve your qualifications. Plus, it's all free. Again, take the quiz at accept.com slash MBA quiz to obtain your complimentary assessment. Now, if you are a regular listener, you know that during most episodes of Admission Straight Talk, I interview a guest, frequently an admissions director or dean. I also have many times asked these guests, what do you think about applicants using ChatGPT or artificial intelligence when writing their application essays? Today's episode is a collection of their answers to that question with a little commentary from me, but mostly it's admissions directors at top MBA programs sharing what you need to know the good, the bad, and the ugly about using ChatGPT in writing your applications. In this episode, you're going to hear from Claire Norton, Columbia Business School's Senior Associate Dean for Enrollment Management, Sherry Hubert, Associate Dean of Admissions at Duke University's Fuqua School of Business, Blair Mannix, Executive Director of Graduate Admissions at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School, Eric Askins, Executive Director of Full-Time MBA Admissions at UC Berkeley Haas, and Dean Robert Solomon, the inaugural Dean at Stern at NYU Abu Dhabi. I've asked this question of almost every admissions director I've spoken to. So these responses represent a sample. And there is some difference. There's more differences on this one than on some other questions. But in any case, I think you'll, you'll see that there is cautious acceptance of ChatGPT with several caveats and warnings for applicants. In any case, let's start with Claire Norton of Columbia Business School. I think ChatGPT is a tool and there are many, many tools that we have now that we did not once have, right? At, at some point in time, we thought to ourselves, you know, if people use a calculator, will they understand math? Like, yes, they do still understand math. And in fact, probably higher level math than they understood before that was utilized broadly. Mm -hmm. And I suspect ChatGPT will be quite similar. Um, we've made it very clear to students in our application process that it's a tool that can be utilized, but generative AI is not something that can, you know, write the, the whole answer, right? It's the kind of thing that could uh, do some editing for you or provide you with some ideas to, you know, make sure that you've touched upon, right? But that the the work must be your own. So, you know, from that perspective, I, I think we're, we're quite clear. But also, I think actually back to what we were just talking about, the best applications are reflective truly of the individual right. and our essay questions in particular, right? Like we are really asking you to say for you personally, what is it about this that is going to connect, assist you, you know, help your growth, engage you in new ways? And, you know, generative AI is not capable of saying that in a way that is authentic. So right. that's really, you know, what we'll be looking for. And so I think, again, um, it's nice to have something, maybe check your grammar, right? So right, right, <laughs> it's right. there for those kind of things, right? But it's never going to give, uh, you know, an answer that and it can, can't. can tie together. It's, it's not, it's not intended to, it's, it, no. you know, I, I, I use, um, I have a daughter who loves to bake. You know, uh, packaged cookies just don't taste as good as her for her fresh made cookies out of the oven or bread or whatever it is that she likes to bake. Yeah. Yeah. There's a little bit of her in that recipe that just can't be replicated. Yeah. Right. Right. So right. same, same for this. So, so yeah, I think it, um, I think it'll actually be exciting to see, you know, what it does. And, and we, as a school are obviously, as I mentioned earlier, thinking about, 
you know, what kind of training do our students need and how do we engage with it as a tool yeah. and make sure that they know how to engage with it as a tool and think about, you know, what kind of management is required and what data is missing from the data sets that these kinds of tools are drawing upon, right? So there are lots of great and important questions for us to engage in in the classroom. So we're certainly not shying away from it. It's it's something we think is important, but I think it, it won't be problematic from an admissions perspective, given Again, the fact that, A, we're we're letting people know what our honor code is and how we expect them to utilize it and that we also, you know, really are looking for personal insights in our essays. For a slightly different perspective, let's hear from Sherry Hubert of Duke Fuqua. First of all, let me just say I can only speak to our policy within admissions, Mm -hmm. as it may vary across the university and then the school, Fuqua school, in terms of classroom use. It's really going to be up to the faculty to decide that. Mm -hmm. But within admissions, um, you know, allowing the use of AI in their application, and we have decided to allow it, it, it felt like the way to be the most inclusive while still requiring that applicants authentically represent themselves. We see a difference between plagiarism and the use of AI, and that plagiarism is explicitly using material created by someone else, while we expect that the use of AI, at least you know, in terms of how they might use it to answer our essay questions, which are unique to Fuqua, you know, the use of AI, it, it has to begin anyway with this level of personal reflection, right? I mean, to answer our essay questions, you need some level of personal reflection. You need your own kind of uh, content and your own lived experiences to inform it. But we also, you know, we see that we know that AI could be useful in terms of, you know, helping people organize their thoughts or represent them better, differently, you know, through the use of AI, AI tools. You know, we see similar to how people use Grammarly or they may have friends who are English majors and they ask them to review their their essays or they may use admissions consultants to say, hey, take a look, provide some coaching and guidance um, around around their 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 essays. So, again, we view this as a tool that enhances the process, but should not and does not replace the requirement for authenticity and the use of your own material. Right. And so in our minds, I mean, I like to say AI at Fuqua stands for authentic individuality. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I know, right? Right, right. 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 And we're, you know, we're going to assume positive intent and that applicants are ethical and they're good agents in this process. And so, you know, we do require that your application be a true and accurate reflection and representation of your lived experience and exclusively your own. And then we do, like you said, use plagiarism tools. So for us, all essays are scanned using plagiarism detection soft- software. But again, we see a difference between plagiarism and the use of AI tools. So we have a long kind of disclaimer about, you know, how expressing your ideas by mm-hmm. using verbiage that's not so- sourced, right, is improperly credited, is, is a, a violation of our honor code. And, and it is grounds for denying application. Blair Mannix, University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School, sees ChatGPT as a school that can be used appropriately or inappropriately. It's up to you, but let's hear from her. Faculty have done great work on the use of ChatGPT in passing Wharton exams. There's a couple of fun articles about that too, but this is where the Office of MBA Admission stands. This is where I stand. My view personally is being fearful of ChatGPT and what it means for society is like being scared of email. It's coming. It's here. It's an efficiency tool. People will be using it. I don't believe it's the right move to gatekeep using an efficiency tool, especially if we expound, you know, if we say that we're cutting edge business leaders, cutting edge business leaders outside of our walls should be using ChatGPT to speed up their work. Now, ChatGPT, as we all know, has limitations. You know, there's studies in law schools that, you know, they put fake legal precedents and some of the answers they yeah, do. You have to check it. Of course, you have to check it. But I think it's only going to get better. And so I think it's a it's an efficiency tool. Behind the scenes, we use it for our own work. Faculty at Wharton use it for their own work. I think people should use it going forward. And so I have no reason to or no plans to put a disclaimer on our application saying, please don't use ChatGPT. Because we all know it's not good. You're going to have to to work with it. And I think that's okay. Okay, great. And now Eric Askins from UC Berkeley Haas who talked about how his views about ChatGPT have evolved. I think I've gone on the journey that a lot of my peers have gone on. Uh, the first piece of this journey was, well, I hope our fraud software can catch it. And I think I think a lot of the world has gone on this journey with us where, you know, you stop and then you say, well, this is this is a tool. This is a tool like the calculator is a tool. I think that's probably the common thread I've heard. If you're, you know, it's, I've already had, you know, typing in an email and I'm getting suggested 
next three sentences. Right? This is this is where we are. The tool exists. You know, I I am still going to suggest that there's no tool that's going to tell me your career goals. Now, that tool might help you articulate those career goals a little bit better, uh, but those goals still have to be yours. Uh, there's no tool that's going to tell me the, the moment that made you feel alive or why it gave meaning to you. It may, it may be that that tool helps you frame your thoughts, put those pieces together in a way that, that's cohesive. If, you're, if, you're, if English is not your first language and you're trying to organize your thoughts in a way that would give you the, the, the tools to succeed, it could very well be that this is a really useful tool to organize, but those core thoughts have to be yours. I think that's key here. And I don't think that, that we're going to move on that, that concept, but those core thoughts and ideas have to be yours. And then if you're going to use the tool, I hope that you use it well. I hope that you that the, the maybe the thing you're demonstrating to me is your expertise in the use of the tool, because I will, and we have seen already poorly framed and poorly worded things that don't really seem to capture the individual. Right. Uh, this is probably the first year that we're starting to see that. That makes sense that this is the first year you're seeing it. I, I've played with it a little bit. If they and I've said this before on the podcast, if you use it blindly, you're going to produce drivel, very generic and not very meaningful. If you use it either to edit your work, perhaps to generate some ideas or to help you structure an essay, but the ideas are your own, perhaps it has value, but you're still going to spend a significant amount of time on it. Well, so you, should, you yeah. might, yeah, or you see, you might as well just write the thing. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I'm one of those folks that believes the magic happens in the editing. I know other people think it happens in the writing, which is the idea generation. I think it's the moment where you come back and say, oh, well, now I see how those pieces should fit together. And so with, with that in mind, I understand that the tool may be used. We have a, a statement at the bottom of our application. We haven't changed it. We've had it for a while. It says every, you know, the work product seen here is, is mine and mine alone. I think folks should be able to answer that honestly. The okay. work product here is mine and mine alone. Now, right. if that means that they used a tool to take their ideas and put it on paper, and then they reorganized it to reflect the story that they wanted to tell, and they feel that that is theirs. You know, they were the producer of the ideas. They were the producer of the of the finished product. They used an intermediary tool, the same way you might use a spell checker or a grammar checker. You know, I'm going to have to just accept that that's the world that we're in today. I don't think there's exactly. any magical tool that solves that one yet. You know, generative AI is probably the best tool to catch generative AI. Probably. So, but I am, I'm going to focus on the content. And okay. as long as the content's strong, I think that that's going to be in the candidate's best interest. And rounding out this sample is Dean Robert Solomon at NYU Abu Dhabi, who speaks not only about applicants using ChatGPT in their applications, but how he as a professor has used ChatGPT as an educational tool. As a teacher, uh, it bothers me a little bit that students um, might rely on ChatGPT and not hand in their own original work, that they use it as a crutch, um, especially those who sort of, you know, People use it when they're short for time, they're being a little lazy, they were like, oh, well, I'll just have this, this program do it. So that bothers me a little bit, but I think now the onus, as again, as an educator, the onus then becomes, is on us to create assignments that maybe leverage the benefits of ChatGPT and bring it as a tool to help enhance learning. So we're st all still trying to figure it out together. In the meantime, though, we can't have students just using it to, to as you know, to, to copy and paste to their assignments. And we have a policy against that. On the applicant side, we do have, we do have a policy. Well, one of the things that we ask our students is to, to verify that they have not received any outside support in preparing their essays and their application. And, you know, that, that students who are found to have, uh, to have gained the system and to have used outside to support, we can revoke their admissions. So, you know, we do have those policies, but again, the onus is on us to create prompts that make it difficult to use things like ChatGPT. You know, on the admission side, we wanna know who the students are and we don't wanna know what ChatGPT thinks, we wanna know what you think. And in the classroom, we want you to learn. We want you to push yourself. We want you to, you know, enhance your capabilities. And, and you can only do that if you really are putting in the effort and not relying on an outside tool to do it for you. Right. I think there's also a difference between using an outside tool and relying on an outside tool. Right, right, right. Yeah, I don't mind them using outside tools. 
right? To, and and I'm, I've been designing a little bit assignments that leverage ChatGPT in a way to help students learn. Could you, could you share students. an example? Would you be willing to share an example? Yeah, one example could be you actually put the prompt in ChatGPT that you want students to answer, and then you ask them to critique the response from ChatGPT. Ooh, what did clever. ChatGPT get right? What did ChatGPT get wrong, and why? Another thing that I that I do in my classes is I have students work together in class, and it's I go from group to group. We have discussions in small groups, so and, and it's they have to think on their feet. So it, it's not they're not prompts. The discussions yeah. that we have are not prompts that ChatGPT would know how to answer. So those are the ways that I approach it. But yeah, I mean, you're exactly right, which is we, we, want, we want students to use it as a tool. We don't want students to rely on it to do their work for them. If students can use ChatGPT, so can profs and the administration. After all, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. To summarize, most of the MBA admissions committee members view ChatGPT as a tool, some with more trepidation than others, but in any case, like all twos, it can be used well and it can be used very poorly. Relying on, on, on it blindly is a recipe for generic, vapid, empty, boring essays, probably a rejection. Providing ChatGPT with a lot of input and specifics coming from you can help. However, it may take as long as you're just sitting down and writing your essays. If you choose to use ChatGPT, First, really think about what you want the schools to know about you. ChatGPT can't discern what you're most proud of. It can't know, unless you tell it with a fair amount of detail, when you assume leadership responsibility or what are the life challenges that you have overcome. It can't say without you giving it lots of information where you excelled or when you handled an interpersonal challenge with finesse. Recognize its limitations and first put in the necessary thought so that you can have an application that is thoughtful, authentic, and effective. If you'd like help in presenting the best of the authentic you, please contact Accepted for guidance in presenting your best self and polishing that gem of an application. Go to accepted.com slash MBA slash services. Discover how Accepted's experts can help you and take advantage of an initial free consultation. Thank you listeners for joining me today. Quick reminder, for a quick 100% free resource, take Accepted's MBA admissions quiz. Get your quick reality check and tips for improvement. Just go to accept.com slash MBA quiz and do it ASAP. Thanks again for coming. This is Admissions Straight Talk produced by Accepted and I am your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week. <laughs>